Okay. Recording's pending. Let's give this a second to catch up here. There we go. All right. Recording is going. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the ASCE, EWRI, and AFSBES Joint Committee on Fisheries Engineering and Science free webinar series and today's talk. Um, this webinar is being recorded, as I mentioned. My name is Kathy Hoverman, and I will be moderating today's webinar. This is our fourth and final webinar of the year on fish passage, dam removal, and other related topics. Uh, a couple of announcements for everyone. Our 2022 program uh, is currently in development and will be announced in January. Uh, for now, we invite you to uh, view some of our past recordings that we have on our YouTube channel. You can find our webinar recordings by searching Joint Committee Fish Passage on YouTube, or you can also go to our committee's website. Uh, I'm going to drop in the chat the um, the uh, web address when I when I get a second when I'm done talking. So there will be a quick access link for that for everyone to look at. Um, I've also shared in the files of the Teams site associated with this web webinar um, our presenters PDF version of the presentation. Uh, and then, of course, this video will also be available afterwards as well when we post it on there. Um, also on our website, we do post job opportunities and other community announcements. If you would like to add something to that, um, then uh, that information needs to go to Rachel Waiter. I will give you her email address as well, in which you can send information that you would like posted on our website. OK, last thing, we're also working on updating our email list and webinar announcements. If you're currently on our email list, you should receive an email at some point confirming that you wish to remain subscribed. Uh, so when you get that, definitely take a moment to click through the email and make sure we have your up to date information and, and contact info. Um, all right, uh, the chat window will be used at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can ask questions during the webinar if you would like, but we will wait till the end to actually uh, ask those to our presenter and get some answers to everyone. So um, for something a little different today, I'm going to hand things off to a fellow committee member, uh, Michael Chelminski, to introduce today's speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you for all you do for this committee. Folks, welcome to the Joint Committee webinar today. We've sponsored free webinars on a diversity of topics relevant to fish passage and fish protection. Um, and that's been kind of our hallmark. In 2020, we sponsored webinars that diverged to shake from technical topics and waded into stakeholder engagement and team building. And I want to thank Gwen McDonald of Save the Sound and Megan Lung of Nui Pick, affiliated with New York State DC for those. Today's presentation is by Dwayne Shaw of the Down East Salmon Federation, DSF. Dwayne's going to knit it all together for us by presenting the successes of DSF that knit together both technical expertise and daring and broad stakeholder engagement. It's just it's wicked cool. If you go to DSF's website, you see their successes are fantastic. Three million salmon hatched and just the coolest hatcheries Dwayne's going to tell you about. 45 miles of rivers they've conserved and restored to put those fish in. 600 acres of land that's protected along the rivers. So we all know that it's fish. They're great. Rivers are great. You need land along it. Just like you need stakeholders, it's big system. And what do they do with stakeholders? They've got diverse partnerships, 28 according to their website. As you may su suspect, DSF has created a monster. The more habitat you create or protect, the more fish you need to create. Or the more fish you create, the more habitat you need. And so the fish eats its tail. Uh, this is the tale of DSF. Uh, their work is special. To me, they're like a favorite place on a river, and we all have those, I think. Uh, as an engineer, a great cathedral, a building, or a bridge, or the best dive bar on earth, the place you think only you know about it. Ultimately, they're like the merry pranksters of Atlantic salmon. They're out there, they're getting it done. It's a brave new world. Um, I'm a supporter of DSF. I'm a member, and I consider myself fortunate to be able to contribute to them. I ask you to also consider DSF, supporting DSF. Go to their website. Uh, they're like poetry. So without further ado, let's hear from the Archbishop of Maine, Dwayne Shaw of the Downey Salmon Federation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. 
I uh, really appreciate the invitation and um, the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you. Thank you for attending and uh, to the organizers for, for um, making sure this comes off well. So um, without further ado, I'll be um, talking about our org organization, Downey Salmon Federation, we're an angler based organization started um, next year will be our 40th year. So we've been around for quite a while and we work primarily in easternmost Maine, but our work extends out throughout Maine and we work on endangered populations of, of Atlantic salmon. And as probably many of you know, um, Atlantic salmon were listed about 20 years ago at the federal level, uh, still not listed at the state level due to the controversial nature of the work, um, political such as it is. Um, but what we've done as an organization is to take a, a, a technical approach, a community based ecosystem based approach, and we're looking to fill sort of the gaps as um, this has been an elusive task to recover endangered Atlantic salmon. People here in Maine have been working on this in New England for um, near two centuries uh, with not a lot of success to show, but there's room to to innovate and that's part of what I'll be talking to you about today. So um, Kathy had suggested the uh, PDF as well. So some of you are are going to flip through this with your own um, PDF of this presentation. So as we go, I'll I'll try to remember to to uh, let you know what page we're on. So we're on the first page here. The uh, what I'm going to be talking about primarily is the the rearing methods that we're using and so-called naturalized rearing methods. So many of you may be aware that hatcheries are are considered one of the threats to to fisheries in the in the sense that you can domesticate the the species that you're the wild species that you're trying to restore. Some some hatcheries are are production facilities and they they support put and take fisheries and so on. With a conservation hatchery and a naturalized um, method of rearing the fish, we're seeing better results than you what we've typically seen using other methods. So, and I'll talk about what that, how we define that. Um, so what we what we had done was to create. Um, we were approached in a partnership with a proposal from the North Atlantic Salmon Fund based in in Iceland. Um, Ori Vigfason was the key player there, who's unfortunately passed now but he had discovered this uh, success in salmon recovery on the Tyne River of all places in England northeast England in Northumberland right against the Scottish border in a place that you might be familiar with uh, near Newcastle so the Tyne River is one of the biggest salmon six Atlantic salmon success stories in world history Peter Gray was at the center of that and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Peter and his design of the Kielder Hatchery. If if any of you are interested in salmon fishing, you might want to consider going to the Tyne because what was once a um, a dead river is now restored. So I'm going to try to page forward here, and for some reason my page is is not working. Let me. Uh, Okay. Escape is not working. Hmm. Okay. So this worked perfectly before. If anyone has a brilliant idea, just let me know. Dwayne, did you try using your arrows for control? That's what I'm using. Yeah, that's what I used yesterday in our little test run, and it worked yep. just fine. And uh, yeah. perhaps take it out of presentation mode to, um, to now reset I it. Get my bar to show with my controls, and my escape isn't working. Let me see. Okay, I could stop. Let me see if it's going to be allowed. I'm going to stop presenting and then try to come back in. Sure. Sorry. No worries. Uh, while we're waiting for Dwayne to do that, um, I did. I am dropping right now our committee's 
uh, web address uh, directing you to our page there. And, Can you see that? Uh, Dwayne, we do not have your screen yet. Uh oh. Looks like Dwayne is frozen. And now I'm dropping in Rachel's email address for your use if anybody wants to share um, announcements, job postings, things like that for the website in general. All right, we're going to give Dwayne a, a couple minutes here to get back to us. In the downtime, I'm going to put a plug in for one of my my personal favorite activities that comes around twice a year, World Fish Migration Day. It's coming up in uh, May of 2022. Uh, if you are a part of an organization or an individual who wants to plan an event, there's always room for more people planning those events. Uh, the World Fish Migration Foundation has a website. Check that out. Um, look at opportunities to create partnerships and uh, connect with people about the importance of free flowing rivers and um, uh, World Fish Migration Day is all about that event and activity. So um, I know here in Richmond, Virginia, I've got a great crew of folks that I partner with um, every every year this comes up and we put out an event and we'll do another one again in 2022. I encourage all of you to do that as well. Looks like Dwayne's coming back in now, so let me get him hooked back up as a presenter. And hopefully we can uh, we can get this going again. Kathy, perhaps we should ask Dwayne to shut down his video to mind the bandwidth. Yeah, I think so. So, Dwayne, you should have been put back up to presenter mode. If you want to take Mike's suggestion of just not starting your video. There we go. <laughs> Dwayne, we can't hear you yet if you are talking, though, so you will need to unmute. OK, how about that? All right, we can hear you. You want to go ahead and put that in presentation mode or you want to? I'm going to try right it like now. this. I just okay. clicked presentation mode. Let me um, take off my camera. Slideshow. Well. OK, can you hear me? We can hear you and your camera is also on. If, if you think it'd save some some functionality to turn your camera off. Feel free to do that. OK. OK. Doesn't want to s seem to want to go. There we are. OK. All right, we got you. Go uh, ahead, Dwayne. So there we are. Um, in salmon recovery, we we think a lot about dam removals. Of course, the salmon need to get to their habitat. We all know that. Here's an example of a dam removal we did adjacent to our, our hatchery, which is based in a former hydro plant on the East Machias River. Um, these breakthroughs can look like this. So what I am presenting here is information about how do you retrofit a hatchery? How do you make a hatchery suit the salmon that you're trying to recover. In other words, to keep them as wild as possible such that they can perform well and survive, do the full um, cycle of their migrations and come back and jumpstart the population such that you can then turn the hatchery off. And that's exactly what's happened on the River Tyne in England. They've they've dialed the hatchery way, way back. So the, the function of of a hatchery in this sense, a conservation hatchery, is to recover a wild fish, not for a put and take fishery. So there's a lot of um, dispute about hatcheries and you may have seen the, the film um, 
artificial, which kind of conflated a lot of different hatchery issues together and, and caused some confusion. In our case, what we're doing is um, using straight river water, unfiltered. We're using wild origin um, fish of native genetics. As you see, the tanks are black. We accelerate the flow in the tanks and we're using an incubation system that replicates um, a, uh, a wild red or a, gra a nest in the gravel. And the, and the measure of our success in part is what do these fish look like? Do they have all their fins? As some of you've seen, fish coming out of many hatcheries often have these rounded fins, and obviously they need their fins for a reason. So um, the ultimate measure for us visually is, are they the right color? Are they the right size? And do they have really beautiful fins? This is a, a film of the Tyne, a very short film, and I'm gonna show you this. This is in downtown Newcastle. This is in a river that was considered essentially dead um, for many years. And here we go. This is slide four, but yeah. let's see if I can get this to run. What we're seeing here is what was declared the Red River. Dwayne, we can't really, really hear you with the video running. Um, probably it's just too much. So yeah. when you hit stop, we'd be happy to hear what you have to say on this. So what I, what I was saying while that was running was that this is, that's what a, a, a river, a success story looks like, obviously. And, and that's in downtown Newcastle, which is a very industrialized setting. Um, the river in the upper sections is, is uh, there's a lot of agriculture. I've never seen so many sheep in all my life. And um, however, it's, it's, lightly developed in the upper part of the watershed and there's a hydroelectric dam in the very top of the system and that's how the Kielder hatchery got got created was as a mitigation for the lost habitat and when peter gray came into the picture there as the manager he designed the facility as this sort of naturalized um, style hatchery this is just a photo of uh, fishing in maine in the in the good old days back in the 50s all the way up through until the late 80s there was um, Atlantic salmon fishing this is in cherry field here um, so what what we've done and and Michael talked about the variety of programs that we operate and in the one that's the most complex really is even though of course doing dam removal is very complicated and uh, negotiating to purchase property for for buffers, um, Michael, the, the number is 6,000 acres that we've protected along the rivers. And um, that's about 45 miles of prime um, habitat, riparian buffers and shaded streams and, and all those things we look for. But this element, the wheel on the, on the trike that we're trying to operate here, that's been moving slower than the rest. So dam removals are, are moving pretty steadily um, the the limits placed upon angling and commercial fishing and and other activities that directly impact the fish themselves have been progressing quite well but the the piece around the hatchery portion of this the husbandry methods the the work around genetics has been accelerating tremendously over the last few decades in that that um, ultimate question that was at play when the fish got listed is, are there any wild fish left, was answered by the geneticist um, to suffice um, for moving forward with the Endangered Species Act designation. 
So we've got very advanced um, genetics management of these eight populations with that are remaining in the state of Maine. However, the piece that's slow again is on the hatchery side. So the capacity of the hatcheries is one thing. Um, and then the style of uh, the rearing methods being used is another element of this. So it's quality and quantity of the impacts of the hatchery. So what you see represented here on the right are the um, return rates based upon different stocking strategies. And I'll talk about the different types of strategies that are being used and that are being tested. Um, the Downey Salmon Federation, as I said, has been established. It was established largely by anglers back in the early 80s um, in a region that is um, impoverished and uh, remote in easternmost Maine and um, has not received necessarily the attention that some of the bigger rivers would. So the rivers that we work on here are the uh, the Denny's, which is very close to the Canadian border, right up against the St. Croix River, which is the border river, the East Machias, the Machias itself, or the West Machias, the Pleasant and the Narraguegas. We're also involved on the Union River, which is kind of the gateway to Acadia National Park in the Ellsworth area. That river is dammed up and, and has no fish passage right at the head of tide to speak of. So the other rivers are largely dam free. So state of Maine is um, the location of this distinct population segment comprised of eight different populations, but uh, viewed as a whole, there is designated critical habitat. Some of it is occupied with with salmon. Some of it is is cut off because of um, dams and other things. And we're in that easternmost section that you see represented there. Here's the dam that we removed when it was first built. You might notice there's something missing uh, called water in in the fishway, in particular on the right hand side. Uh, these fish have gone through, a, you know, a bottleneck. However, as we've said, the geneticists have looked at this. There are populations remaining. Um, we we worked with the town government to remove that dam and state and federal agencies, and and then we took ownership of the building, as you see on the bottom left here, which we had a vision for, and at the time it was it was just a dump and abandoned essentially with pigeons and rats and the whole nine yards. Um, this is, an, is what we've done with the building. We've, it sits in the middle of this very beautiful New England town right on the river, right next to the rail trail and within sight of, of Route 1. And we're right at the head of tide. <clears throat> so we say, uh, you know, our little byline is fix the river and fix the fish both. We hear a lot about fixing rivers, but very, very little in the recovery world about how is it that we're handling the fish. Here's another example of some of the fix the river activities, taking out these roads. Uh, this is where our land trust came to bear, uh, such that we, we purchased the property after years of negotiation with the landowner. Ultimately, um, he, he offered the entire property to us, which we purchased because of its um, importance for fish passage and and buffers. And now we're stocking this very stream segment. This is Beaver Dam Stream right next to Route 9, uh, the so-called airline road. Peter Gray Par Project. Again, a picture of the fish with, with beautiful fins and the river at the head of tide in our, in our location there. Peter Gray. Peter was an interesting person and he was the perfect person to to bring forward kind of some new thinking and and ultimately a breakthrough <clears throat> in that is that Peter had an eighth grade education, formal education, eighth grade, went into the coal mines like most of his family always had in um, the Newcastle area, hated it and and became a bailiff or a game warden that led to him and his um, aptitude for husbandry or as he called it stockmanship um, to end up in the hatchery side of things 
and the reason I like to put forward this photo of him with his his prize foul, and he was a judge of fancy foul, um, is that it shows one end of the spectrum. This is the domesticated to the hilt at end of the spectrum of what you can do with a wild jungle hen over hundreds of years and turn it into all of these these uh, um, you know, captive varieties of chickens that we see now. Well, the other end of that spectrum is to, how do you use your husbandry to keep a wild fish as wild as possible? So he applied himself to that question and then also looked was involved in a big debate around the numbers game. How many fish do you need to put in to a system such that you can jumpstart it? And then, like I say, turn off the hatchery, perhaps go to the next river and, and start again. So as you see in this in this piece here, um, there are over 13,000 adult salmon coming back to this river. So there's a huge fishery here. There's uh, clubs in pubs and along the river and you can imagine the clubs meet in the pubs and they talk about fishing and you know, the, that advanced on its own so again a little closer look at the system itself the incubator box that you see replicates a, a wild um, uh, nest and those elven are down in that incubation box for a couple of months the hatchery manager cannot touch them cannot see them we sit there with blind faith, knowing that those fish are doing what they should be doing. And, and Peter had explained to us when we, when we created this partnership to sort of do this technology transfer from England, which was, by the way, sponsored by an American hedge fund manager who was working in London and saw the success, paid for Peter and Ori to come to find the partner. They, <clears throat> they had essentially what Peter had explained is, you know, what he had observed, he had not measured. He didn't have the tools, the time to to measure it to the extent that he um, perhaps should have. And he would say, well, any idiot could see that that this was a, a much better uh, way to raise the fish. And, and as a result, he ran into some problems with sort of replicating this in England, and that's a whole book unto itself, which um, ultimately there is a book written about this. Um, so we had to measure all of this. So we we created these incubation boxes, which, by the way, were originated in, in, um, in Canada many, many years prior and brought to England and then ended up back here again on this continent. And sure enough, these fish were 17% larger coming out of this box when they swim out on their own and the hatchery manager isn't intervening and determining the timing for which those fish should be put into the bigger tank. They swim out there and um, they're on their own timing. It's like a big bell curve of some preemies that hatch early and then the late bloomers that come in later, but they all need feed at the absolute proper time for their brain development and all those types of things and ultimate behavior. We put into the black tank with the uh, white circles so that we can see what's going on, but they prefer the black background. Again, unfiltered water. What are we trying to achieve here? We're, what, um, what this is really about is occupying the habitat again. So as you see in this map and, and where I'm page 19 here, or slide 19, there is a lot of vacant habitat in what is designated critical endangered salmon habitat. So as we rebuild these rivers, as we, as I say, put Humpty Dumpty back together again, we're not going to see salmon migrate in here, wander in from Labrador or uh, Quebec, or we've got to repopulate them using this triage hatchery conservation methodology or else we risk these small remnant populations going extinct. So we've been forced into this hatchery um, work and you can see that there's a lot of habitat and it's being opened up 
very, very rapidly with the culvert removals and dam removals and fishways, which we're working on. So ultimately, the the um, the question that we have been answering is, can you culture a fish in such a way that they survive better and they go to sea and they return? So we measure each step of the way. We measure hump the survival in the facility itself, the survival after a year in the river, the survival after two or three years in the river when they migrate out as smolts. So we stock them as par, which are roughly a three inch fish. And then we're looking at their overall um, uh, demographic composition. So their age and, um, and measuring their uh, comparative size to what we know is to be wild origin fish. And all of these metrics are showing us where we're working toward an improved um, output of this hatchery. So as you see on the on the graph on the bottom left, the numbers are are headed upward. This is bucking the trend of much of what we see in the state of Maine. We've done this through the methods of of the um, the quality of the fish that are being put out. Remember, their genetics are the same as the genetics of other um, fish being stocked at different um, age sizes or <clears throat> um, life stages. And then we're also looking at increasing the densities, the amount of fish that we're putting out and of course, letting nature have its um, way and in, to, to have the strong survive. So the results, and we're doing this watershed wide in um, the highest quality habitat while improving the, the um, <clears throat> the quality of the habitat with woody debris and other things. So what we're calling large par here are the are the par a year after we put them out. So they typically will stay in the river for two to three years. We put them out after just a few months um, at the, in the fall once the water temperatures drop. And so we're looking at so-called large par. We're able to look back in time, look at other stocking approaches in this very same watershed going back into the 70s. And um, there was one uh, brief attempt to use adult um, fish to stock this river as well. We have some of that data. So there's fed fry, unfed fry, fall par. Um, many rivers like the Penobscot is largely stark, stocked with what we call accelerated smolts. These are smolts that are one year old instead of two or three years old as a which is an intervention choice on US Fish and Wildlife Service part. And of course, is a domestication effect upon those fish. Here, what we're looking at is over those periods of years using those different methods, we've seen a steady decline in the overall number of so-called large par, the two year old par in until we we kicked in with this project and as you can see we're we're up above um substantially above um where things had been going in in comparison to other rivers um we're seeing the same the same uh, comparative benefits of this this information and this methodology is part of a much larger effort really worldwide to look at the impacts of of hatcheries and the use of hatcheries as a as a triage tool for endangered populations so we're privy to some of the things that have gone on in norway england and in the pacific as well one way of of looking at this across watersheds with with our very limited capabilities state and federal government, some NGO involvement is to look at uh, so-called CPUE, catch per unit effort. And if you look at the left here, page, I guess that's slide 26, the East Machias 2.2 per minute. So this is electrofishing data. And, and this work has been conducted in partnership with 
uh, state and federal governments. Um, so this data is produced by Maine DMR. They're doing this across many watersheds, as you see here. And um, in the East Machias, the, the results are substantially higher. So standardized um, locations across watersheds that are tested over time for population. Another look at the same. Um, and this is it, at the top of the slide. It says uh, with class B, six to 12 meter wide streams. So we break the streams down into different size classes and we can look at the result of, of stocking fish of different ages into different size classes of stream. As it turns out, what we seem to be seeing now is that uh, often, but not always, um, unfed fry, which is the standard procedure currently, with the exception of the Penobscot with the smolt program, unfed fry could do quite well in the tiniest of streams, but most habitat is in the larger segments of the river system, so the main stem in these uh, B width classes. Fry will do very poorly there as represented here, whereas this uh, the PAR does much better. Um, this is our smolt trapping site, Route 193 out of East Machias, and it's at the near the bottom of the watershed. So we we get a pretty good handle on what's coming out of the river system each spring. And then so we're looking at that last winter of survival before they head out to the ocean. And as you see in this slide, an upward trend over time. And with the exception of that one year, 2015, you may all remember the um, if you were in Maine or in New England, shoveling a lot of snow that winter and extremely cold temperatures, unusually cold temperatures, and clearly it had an impact. And, and we know that this was across the board with um, brook trout populations as well as other salmon populations. So that gives us a bit of a clue as to where we're losing fish in some situations. And that is in a situation where habitat suitability has been impacted, perhaps by historic log drives, um, most likely as a result of historic log log drives taking out um, structure in the in the systems where there's winter refugia. So, but otherwise, you see this upward trend as a result of all of this data. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and Maine DMR have have um, after 10 years of largely private investment, though uh, partnership with the agencies, but the funding largely private, coming from people like Mike Chelminski and others, um, they've now said we're 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 sold. We're we really um, are bought in in the the five year plan and 10 year plans that are being developed by the agencies for the recovery of salmon now reflect that the PAR, this naturalized PAR method should be adopted more widely and as rapidly as possible. Here you're looking at a graph. Again, it's the, that same data, but represented across in comparison to the um, one of the goals that we, we hold out in this work, and that's to produce at least one small per unit of habitat. Um, Many other watersheds are nowhere near where we are. We're, we're getting quite close to that one per unit goal that we've had. And as we've stocked more PAR, we've not, we've not seen uh, a response. Overall, we, we believe we're sort of seeing now kind of the carrying capacity of the watershed, which means we can pair back perhaps, um, though there's some, I have to say, debate about well, we're what we're doing here is representing what this river is capable of in drought period, because we've largely we've seen a lot of abnormal years, which may become the new normal. But what happens when you get an exceptionally good year? So the opposite of the exceptionally bad winter, if we had an exceptionally prime year, 
overall or period of years really because these fish are in the river for a number of years um, are we always batting uh, short of the fence if we don't have the fish there that that could fill those habitats when we have have the prime conditions so there's a cost benefit of of um, effort per outcome obviously um, what this is representing slide 31 is the the age distribution of the smolts headed to sea so remember what we're trying to accomplish is as wild a fish as possible we know that wild fish survive better uh, return at higher rates have better success in reproduction and we know that most of the um, hatchery activity over time has been producing fish that are going out much, much younger than they normally would. I won't dig into this. I could uh, answer questions if people want to follow up. But what we're showing is that we're this small to age three uh, in a wild fish, the W, you wild population, you might see as much as 52% of them going out as three. If you look at our data to the right, we're getting up at 11, 12 percent. That's unheard of with other stocking methods. So that's a, a quite a big success there. Smolt condition factor, another way of looking at these fish. How close are they in in size and in weight and so on to a, a wild fish? And as you can see there, it's quite tight there, which is a great measure of um, representation of wildness. Red counts is a, is a very coarse, crude, and the unfortunately really the only method we have for assessing ultimately wild salmon returns in many of our rivers. We don't have traps on a lot of these rivers, so what we're forced to do is to go out at this time of year, October through um, December, and look for evidence of their spawning, and then to estimate um, how many wild salmon that represents, adults that represents. That can be very difficult with weather conditions and water flow and um, visibility and cloudiness and all these things factor into that. However, we're using the same method across all the rivers, so it's, it's a crude assessment used in the same way across many places over many years, so it gives us a a handle on what's going on. This data um, it, it stops at a point, a very high point here, and you, these are the returning adults. And again, in working with the federal and state agencies, um, we're of course running an experiment here. We need to see the results at the the, the final result, the, the adults coming back. And um, we have this really exceptional year in um, 19 in since then it's dropped back down again two years in a row however nearby rivers are dropping even lower so for instance this fall red counts denny's river zero um, horrible to have to report that that's the river to the east the east machias we've found 15 so far conditions have been difficult um in both cases and the machias on the other side is at i think just a dozen and it's a much much larger river with a lot more habitat so relatively speaking we're we're still um improve you know showing uh, positive results our other facility is in another form of hydro plant another dam that we removed again at the head of tide Endangered Salmon River, Columbia Falls, Pleasant River Hatchery. Tiny little facility. We only operate here and with um, Fry because we have, and, and I'll be done here momentarily um, for questions, but our goal is in the, the goal of the state and federal agencies now is to expand this facility. And, and that's what we're seeking financial support for now so that we can raise par here such that we can stock the Pleasant, but perhaps also the Denny's, which I, I just said is uh, really on the edge of extinction. So while it might not be ideal to, to raise fish from one river in one 
in in one place and then transport them, it's better than the the only other alternatives, which is to raise them off of lake water at the federal hatchery in a, in yet another ha um, location. Just a diagram of what we intend to do in the expansion of that facility. This is the matching grant that we were just issued. This is the largest grant we've ever received. Uh, it's a matching grant dollar for dollar US Fish and Wildlife Service. And we're in our second year. We're at about 370,000. I think that we have in pledges and, and in hand at the moment, and this will help us to operate for the next five years at East Machias and to begin to put some fish in the Narraguegas, which we started this year. There is our uh, address and I'm uh, open for questions. All right, thank you so much, Dwayne. This was great to hear about. Um, please, everyone, put your questions in the chat. We don't have any questions in there right now. Um, it, while we're waiting for, for folks to start asking some questions, um, Dwayne, can, can you, um, how many people are part of your organization and do you have uh, volunteers or anything like that, that that work with you? Yeah, yeah. So we've we started out as completely volunteer organization in 82, um, just focused on Washington County and we've grown over time to have now 12 employees. We have seven biologists on staff, um, some administrative folks, some outreach folks and uh, a ton of volunteers, a load of interns over the years, um, all kinds of cooperative arrangements with with other institutions and and uh, partnerships of many types. We we also created something that we call the Downey's Fisheries Partnership. We co-created this, and this is to sort of bring all of the fisheries it, issues forward and to talk of about them in an ecosystem and a community based approach. So for instance, we work with folks who do shellfish restoration in the estuary and and partner with them around water quality issues. And um, people that are involved with uh, groundfish recovery work who and we know that the alewives river herring are an important prey base. So we we begin to build a bigger effort and that's that's been growing rapidly we work very closely with the Passamaquoddy tribe at Sapayak which is near Eastport we've just uh, this year completed two projects a dam removal and a fishway in the Copscook Bay region with them um, so we also are the only NGO with a section 10 permit to raise rear release monitor endangered Atlantic salmon. So that's a, uh, you know, very important piece of this for us is that we have gone through the process of sort of proving ourselves over time. That's a lot of responsibility, holding millions of endangered animals and doing it with volunteers in part. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't happen overnight. We're also uh, in the process of becoming an accredited land trust through the Land Trust Alliance. So the 6,000 acres of easement and fee lands that we own are, are managed properly. That's great. Good. That, that's <laughs> that's really neat, um, Duane. Um, we have had a couple questions come in, so um, let's let's roll over to those now. Um, the first one that um, popped up is, what is the artificial gravel material utilized in the incubation trays made of, and has it resulted in more natural fin morphology? It it definitely has, and in the material is what is commonly known as smokestack scrubbers. So um, it, some of you might be aware in smokestacks, they want to have a lot of surface area to retain some of the pollutants that would be otherwise leaving the smokestack and Peter Gray had stumbled across this material. It's it's constructed specifically to have a lot of surface area. So he saw that and then um, 
utilized it in this in these uh, incubators. I think originally people had used stones like a river bottom and Peter went with this other method. I think it's easier to clean it. They're a lot lighter and it works really wonderfully. And in order not to um, depart from his methods at all, we ordered that from Germany, just like he had done um, when he got started. So it's, they kind of look like um, a mouthpiece, like you would use for football or hockey. So they're curved like that. And if anyone wants the design specs on this, on these things, we have those. Very cool. Um, I, that your, your description there was very visual for me. I could definitely see the mouth, the, the curved portion of it that you then went on to describe. Um, all right, another question is uh, that they've seen hatcheries with gray metal tanks, but not, not black walled tanks. Is there a biological or growth reason for the black walls in the tanks? Mm hmm. Well, the fish like dark places and and that's what Peter had observed and he just went with black and painted what were baby blue tanks, as you see often in hatcheries, look more like swimming pools and you know, it pleases the human eye more than it pleases the fish and and so that's where the black came from and the white circle in the middle is for the hatchery manager to be able to see what's going on somewhat yeah yeah good um all right uh our friend mike chelminski asks how many par are you adding to the east machias river each year it's it's on the order and it, and it, it bounces up and down anywhere between 150,000 to 300,000 and that number is you know it's dependent upon the survival rates of of the fish that we bring in so the source of eggs comes from the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, live gene bank at Craigbrook National Fish Hatchery and some years they have better uh, fecundity and production there than others there is also a big question too about the quality of of the eggs that are originating from that facility. Remember these these salmon that are being held there were originally caught from each river of origin as as small fish screened for genetics, made sure there weren't any aquaculture escapes in there with them or genes from the aquaculture screened and then raised to maturity in fresh water. Only and then the eggs produced as a result. These fish are hardwired to go to the ocean and so we've we've sort of interfered and because of the limits of the hatchery capacity that's what's happened so the the quality of the eggs that we're receiving is in a question as well okay um all right we have one more question here uh, are you seeing changes either positive or negative in other fish or benthic species with the introduction of par not that we could directly attribute to the par stocking and um, certainly a lot of those par get eaten. We know we know that we're losing some to non-native invasives. Native fish, big brook trout will eat a par, uh, for instance. So we're certainly feeding some of the other critters that are out there with our our you know, product. But the results of our work around Atlantic salmon overall have resulted absolutely in improvements in um, diversity, biodiversity, and abundance of native macroinverts and so on. We've we've been involved with a small project in the East Machias where we're using uh, clamshells, byproduct of the clamming industry, to sweeten the water to address the pH issues that. Of course, connected to acid precipitation. So, in that case, we've actually measured um, abundances and diversity increases in the very small tributary. Okay. Ideally, we'd be doing that at a, at a larger scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are almost at an end. We did get one more question dropped in. Uh, how much of an impact are striped bass having on your work? Um, 
not a lot that we're aware of. It's not like the Miramichi. So the Miramichi, many people may know, they had just a, a huge explosion of, of native um, local population of, of uh, stripers up there. And they eat a lot of salmon smolts coming out of that watershed. They co-evolved together. Of course, our ecosystems are perturbed, so things are out of balance. Um, however, here we don't see a huge number of stripers anywhere. We have a, a steady kind of low level of stripers, but but we know that some fish are being eaten by stripers. Seals, cormorants, of course, the non-native largemouth, smallmouths, and uh, almost anything else with a mouth. Uh, that's why the wild fish are so important in having a prey buffer, as we call, so that the river herring numbers, massive abundance of, of young of the year alewives coming out and adult alewives going in uh, among many other fish are super important as, as providing the food for those stripers rather than them eating the small number of salmon. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that that's the end of our question. So I think that's the end of our webinar. Uh, Dwayne, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we love hearing about your work, the good things you're doing up there in Maine. And uh, I hope this translates well. I know it translates well for somebody else on this webinar. We appreciate everybody tuning in and um, we'll uh, we'll talk to everybody again in the thank new you. year. Thank you so much. Happy Thanks holidays. Well. You too. Bye all.